I'm I'm so sweaty. I can't think straight. <laughs> this thing is so tight on my head. It's squeezing my brain. I I just there's, gl- there's glitter on my face because I thought that would be cool. And now all I can see is glitter glinting on the corners of my eyes. Anyway, I don't feel right. <laughs> And I'm Hannah Hillam. And this, at long last, is our San Diego San Comic-Con Diego. special. We're there right now as you listen to this, probably setting no. up, right? Yeah. Yeah, because this is this is going to come out on that Wednesday. So we're sweating oh, just so sweaty. Prof- as opposed to now when we're not profusely sweating. Oh, my gosh. We're like talking each other down like over yeah. and over because usually that we just take turns doing that. <laughs> Where you're like, I hate this. Not the podcast. Sucks. We're talking about at the convention. Oh, at the convention. We take turns the first day of being like, it's okay. People will buy your stuff. To I'm being like, like, no one will buy anything. Why'd they let me in? Uh, yep. Yeah. We're setting up for preview night right now. As okay. you, Assuming you listen to this, the day it comes out. We're in San Diego. It's like fun. It's chaotic. Fan. It's sweaty. Uh, and as such, we wanted to do a special San Diego Comic-Con, or I should say convention-themed episode convention. this week. Yeah. Um, but before we get into it, let's just talk about a couple of things at the top. Uh, mm-hmm. Most importantly, if you are here in San Diego and at Comic-Con, please come see us. We're in Artist Alley in BB01 and BB02, which uh, we will be selling books, prints, yep. uh, uh, drawings, all kinds of stuff. I'll have microfiber cloths, maybe some toys, I don't know, all kinds of fun stuff that we have. Uh, And also, uh, we're going to be doing, this is like our debut of uh, some stuff that we're going to be selling that's podcast related. Yes. You want to tell them what it is? Uh, Yeah. Hopefully, assuming that we're actually made it by the time we release the episode. Hopefully, our last minute everything, you know, turns out okay. But we are going to be hosting a little scavenger hunt. So if you come to our booth or find someone walking around that gives you one of our fans, literally a fan that like keeps you cool. Yeah, there's little things on it for you to go find around the convention, and when you if you find all of them, you get a a, a cool prize that we that we made. We spent a while figuring out. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be cool. Well, yeah. uh, you'll you'll it's gonna be a surprise. So make sure to come back to the table. Also, uh, the fans they say uh, ask about my tabs on them. Yeah. So we thought it would be a fun thing to do that, so that if you're in line, which I assume most people will be, because uh-huh. there's all these different activations and uh-huh. you know panels and stuff that you're trying to get into. Ask the person next to you about their tabs that they might have open or they might not have have open. It's just a fun little thing to chat with people about if you're bored or if you don't want to talk to anyone, that's your prerogative too. But we're trying. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's what matters. And and it's, it's, you know, you could start a conversation and have an excuse to info dump, which is something I always love. I think people at conventions like to do that in general too. Oh, yeah. I've never been info dumped on more than at a convention. (laughs) Speaking Sometimes. of panels, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of panels, uh, l- one last thing before we get into it: on Saturday at one p.m. in uh-huh. Room Twenty Eight DE, we will be hosting a panel by the title of "Escaping the Algorithm." Uh, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, as of right now, our panelists are: uh, it's going to be Lindsay Ellis, it's going to be Holden McNeely, it's going to be Daisy Noemi, and it's going to be Patrick Ballesteros, who's our friend that's over in Artist Alley as well. We're going to be talking stuff. about. Um, all the things that you can do to build community away from the big social media platforms, whether it's Discord or, you know, trying Patreon. to set up old school Patreon, old newsletters, ways yep. to uh, connect with people and connect with uh, little communities that you want to build that don't get uh, taken and shown or not shown right. and uh, be able to directly <laughs> access people. So it's uh, going it's back to be our awesome. roots, like the, the roots where comics and cartoons first started, which was exactly. on a grassroots level. Which, uh, or most importantly, conventions, which is yeah. why we're in San Diego right now. That that is the uh, the original getting together in public and actually seeing each other's beautiful faces. Yeah. Yes. Uh, anyway, I think that's about it. Uh, we should just get into our tabs yeah. now. So I believe you go first this week. Why don't uh, you go and tell us what you got? Yeah. So first, before I get started, uh, I gotta put on my costume. Hold on, give me a second. <laughs> Gotta take the, For ooh. people who are uh, listening to this and not watching it on YouTube, Hannah is <laughs> putting is on so a. Tight. It looks like underwear that she's pretending is some sort of a <laughs> headband. I can't quite tell what it is. It's got a star on it. Oh my A gosh. red star. It's gold. Is that a is that a Wonder Woman headband? Yes, it is. I ah. am bargain bin Wonder Woman because hold on. Oh my gosh, I'm so sweaty. Oh my gosh, kill me. <laughs> 
You're really bringing the Comic Con experience to the to, to the <sighs> podcast oh my listeners. Gosh, I already hate this. Why don't I... look? This is what I do for you. You, Comic, <laughs> not anyone else. <laughs> Make you feel guilty, but hold on, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I just have to make myself more miserable. Here we go. Oh, I got nice. my uh, Wonder Woman like arm your, bands. Your sweat bands, yeah. I can't emphasize enough how hot and sweaty this is. But, <laughs> but you know what? I love, the, I love it. Listen, there. she's the Amazon woman, right? The Amazon's supposed to be warm. There we go, Wonder Woman. There you go. Whoa, look at um, that! Three stars. Oh yeah, and there's also like stars in uh, by chance. Balloons oh, look at that. and a <laughs> giant the... heart for some reason. Oh yeah, that's my brother-in-law's big cardboard <laughs> heart. Um, so I'm dressed as Wonder Woman, not because I would do this ever, but because my topic today is going to be the history of cosplay. Ah, okay. Yeah, F- it's funny. Speaking of cosplay, uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to wear, uh, and I decided to cosplay as a Comic Con attendee because I was going to say my you're Hel- wearing the Hellfire shirt. Hellfire Club <laughs> that. I remember when that season of Stranger Things came out, I was like, I'm going to get this shirt because it's mm-hmm. cool. And then we got to Comic-Con and every, every single person in the entire convention was also wearing it. Every single like, millennial was wearing it. Like, yep. Yeah, that was like 2022. I feel like every single person, there yep. was like a huge... Yeah, I mean, it's a cool shirt. It's a great shirt. It just was like, I thought I was cool. And then I got there and I'm like, I mean, I guess like, I'm still I cool, but I'm part, of a, I'm part of a community. Yeah, exactly. I'm basic. <laughs> Don't you love that when you realize you're basic? Like... Like, what was it? I, 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 when I started going to conventions, I was like, oh, I'm not unique at all. A bunch of like women dressed in black talking yeah. about being sad, but to show up to my booth. I'm like, cool. Are we all the same? <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank- Thankfully, the bearded guy who likes to draw comics community is very small and <laughs> small. definitely not basic. Yeah. Not completely the entire art of Sally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, anyway, anyway, so history so cosplay. of cosplay. So this this thing is so tight on my head. Okay, this was I dug this out of my daughter's costume bin. This is made for a four year old, uh, so I am stretching this across my head, and it it hurts a little bit. But again, I do it for I do it for the for podcast. Okay, so cosplay. For those okay. of you who are unaware, it is a portmanteau of costume play which is an activity and performance art in which participants called cosplayers wear costumes and accessories to represent a specific character. So even if you've never been to con, you've been in a city where there's been a con uh, and you see these people on public transportation, like carrying mm-hmm. gigantic anime swords and other, I don't know, other stuff, you know, big, literally elaborate, anything like any, dressed anything. up like comic characters, cartoon yeah. characters, TV show characters, video game characters. That's another big one. Yes. I feel like it's often overlooked. Baldur's Gate, dude. I was at London Comic Con. Literally everyone was dressed as someone from Baldur's Gate. I don't know what that is. I had to pretend. Um, anyway, so the word cosplay was coined by um, a Japanese guy named Nobukui Takahashi in 1984. So that's where the term started. And it, it was done using this Japanese, common Japanese linguistics kind of thing they do where they use contracted words, especially when they borrow from English. So stuff like mm-hmm. po- Pokemon uh, is pocket monsters. Uh, right, right, right. Remocon is remote control. Brad Pitt is Burapi. <laughs> Burapi. <laughs> huge, huge yeah. in the cosplay community. Just, or we're just in Japanese. Anyway, so they would just, that's a very common thing in Japanese to take an, an English loan word and kind of combine it into a more Japanese sounding. Anyway, so cosplay. I'm going uh, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna interject here with something that you will deeply love. Uh, which is, as I often tend to on this podcast, I like to tell you that, hey, this reminds me of a sound or a phrase or a word in Farsi that sounds very similar. Go. Yeah. Uh, cosplay is a particularly funny one. Well, tell uh, me. And it's particularly li- particularly lewd. Yes. And all in order the, to everything you teach me for in Farsi is lewd. Listen, <laughs> all I will say is, is that cos sounds very similar to a word in Farsi that sounds like, we'll just say female genitalia. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, woo, woo! So, if you have a Persian friend or an Iranian friend, and you talk to them about cosplay, and they look at it on paper, oh, no. they will give you. A, they'll be like, "What the shit?" <laughs> and I'll just say, "Happy Pride, baby!" <laughs> yeah, and they'll be like, "Excuse me," and they'll think it's really funny. So, oh. it always just the word always makes me laugh uh, because it's got a double meaning. I love. So that. clearly, this person <laughs> did not have any Iranian friends that no. may or may not have stopped them. <laughs> Man. Oh, that could be some, ooh, interesting. I'm going to dress as a giant vagina. (laughs) 
just walk around and say I'm cosplaying. <laughs> I, I will not say it because it's it's very lewd. Even in, know, even in, in the Persian word, it's like it's a little. They're like, oh, you don't really say that out loud. Oh, it's like because uh, okay, this is this is not that kind of podcast. Even even for our Persian listeners, but no, you it's know. not. If you know, you know, as the kids would say. And now I know. So now you know. I get Sorry, to say continue. cosplay for the rest of this time, and that'll be the back of my head. So thank you. <laughs> anyway, so I've known about cosplay for a little while because I was on the internet, and I mm-hmm. used to be really into like Harry Potter fandom stuff back in like 2007. So I'd mm-hmm. be on these. Sorry, 2003 and five, 2003 and four. I'd be on these like fan sites and forums, pretty active, and I'd see all these early, what I thought were early cosplays. So. That was my exposure, and then my friend Griffin, shout out to Griffin, I think he listens, what's up? He loves cosplaying, and I just never Griffin really... Griffin Door? He loves when people say that. <laughs> loves that. <laughs> yeah. So my friend Griffin is really into it, and so I started seeing him do it, and I was like, I don't get it, I just don't get it. Like, there's never been a part of me that's been like, I don't want to dress up as anything. Griffin made this costume one year for Comic-Con that was like an apocalyptic Ash Ketchum. And he oh, had like okay. like a like a dead Pikachu skin as like as like a bag or something. Like it, it was it was pretty morbid and gross, but I loved it. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, well, this is this is legit. And as I got to know more cosplayers and I went to more conventions, all of my biases were like gone. I started realizing it's just people, you know? Because you think that they're like these very <laughs> you're, you're specific. Like, these aren't the real characters from the games and cartoons. They're I, actual people. I can't believe Sailor Moon is not real. <laughs> I saw her about 50 times. Not a single one of them was real. Um, anyway, no, I just, you know, when you don't understand something, you're like, oh, I'm going to be mean about it and I'm going to be scared of it. Yeah. So I wanted to find out more. And having gone to all these conventions, I started finding out from all these people that this is an art. Not that I needed to be told, but. I started you're, you're, you're sharing it. your your journey into understanding yeah. it. You had you had thought of it as a separate thing, and now you're realizing yes. it's similar to what we already do. Exactly, it's a performance art. It's uh, yeah. a way of um, portraying yourself to society and a way of like expressing themselves and and about something they love. So I thought that was pretty cool. So I started thinking, well, where does it start? Obviously, because I always mm-hmm. do that. I have to find the history of every, literally literally every. Always going to go thing. back to the back. Yeah, and so I went back for, to before it was cosplay, all the way back to the Middle Ages. Really? Yes. Okay, so, that's weird. All right. So we're talking like 15... 50- yeah. <laughs> we're talking about somebody dressed up as Peter Stump the werewolf back in like the 1600s. <laughs> I sh- sorry, I should say medieval, not the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages ended in 1300. So the medieval time. So okay. there weren't... It's not necessarily what you think of cosplay now, but there were these carnivals and masquerade balls all over Europe. And mm-hmm. the theater was a huge thing. And there were these kind of stock characters that people would play in the theater. And they would also do pageants and battle reenactments. Like if you're thinking mm-hmm. like a joust, there was also like battle reenactments, like literally like the people do now. Like, like happening. the Civil War reenactment yes. kind of stuff that we see these days. Oh, yeah. it's funny. I didn't realize it had a history that was that old. Yeah. And so the king would like come in and I don't know, be lifted onto a chair because he's inbred or whatever. And he <laughs> would watch these battle reenactments as like part I guess of entertainment. That's the- that's like part of his, that's like the whatever 16th century version of him playing a video game where he's like, I'm going to play the, <laughs> yeah. it's like when you're playing like a World War II like <laughs> video game now, that's Head basically what he Hitler. got to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like Call of Duty, but for the 1500s, basically. Yeah, and way more inbred. Yeah. Yeah. And he probably well, got to actually kill people because he was like, cool, this is fun. Right. I'm murdering peasants. I get to do this <laughs> Respawn. Legally. Yeah, <laughs> respawn. He just dies. Um, so <laughs> they they would dress as these like at these pageants. They would dress as like historical figures and heroes and myth and people from the Bible. <laughs> like a lot of it was religious and okay. And then for I mean, after that makes while, sense. Yeah. yeah. After a while, everyone's like, "This is boring. Let's start making the wild <laughs> costumes." And it kind of it, it picks up a bit in 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 the sixteen and seventeen hundreds in Italy, where the okay. masquerade ball in France, the masquerade balls and these public costumed parties became a huge thing where people would pick like a trope or um, a mythological character to dress up as and come to these and it was mostly for the upper class because you know what else mm. were they gonna do i was gonna say this sounds like the origins also of like the eyes wide shut sex At parties 100%. where they're all wearing like the crazy <laughs> although i think those are austrian masks that they're wearing but or venetian no no they're venetian yeah italy um yeah yeah 
Oh, I'm For sure all sorts yeah. of stuff. This all the crosses over. So cosplay yeah. actually. Has, it works. <laughs> <laughs> it, it works. It actually comes from the old Persian. Yeah. Uh, that, <laughs> turns out you guys started it again. <laughs> no. I personally. You. So we get into that. And that was like proto proto cosplaying, in my opinion. Okay. And it's not until we get to about 1877 when Jules Verne, the early mm-hmm. science fiction author. That yeah, writes, yeah, the writer. You know, Round the World in 80 Days, Journey to the Center of the Earth, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Anyway, he threw this. Inspired by the great moon hoax stories. Don't forget. Oh, you're uh, right. Which we did oh. on a couple episodes ago. Go learn about that if you haven't listened to that episode Yeah, those yet. ones are fun. He was massively popular. Mm-hmm. I-, I would say one of the first sci-fi authors to really like capture the public imagination yeah you know yeah probably the first main one for sure and we're still reading i just read i just read Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea to my kid recently i'm like they're oh, really? still reading this that nice. book is nuts anyway he threw this gigantic party and like 700 people showed up and some of them decided to dress as characters from his novels oh and so, yeah that's so, really cool oh right. my god imagine that can you? I mean, just like 1877. I can. I've yeah. had people dress up as characters from my graphic novels. Are um, you serious? Yeah. Don't you remember? Somebody dressed up as Esteban the Penguin a couple oh, years ago. Oh, yeah. And I like flipped my shit. I was oh. like, what? It's so crazy to see it. What did it. that feel like? Was it like it was flattering? A, I, or? It was more. I was like, I kind of had like a me- I didn't know what to do with it. It was sort of like the yeah. nicest compliment that anyone could have ever given me. And I just. <laughs> I like, like I just I sort of like was gargled like my like I, like right now I don't know what to say I was like I don't should I hug you I I don't know what to do I, I don't know where to place this. this yeah it's a weird it's a really great feeling but it's also a really strange where I'm like I, I there's no analog like, for this I've until never you've yeah experienced, experienced that yeah until you create like a character or a story that you love and that's really important to you and then to have someone reflect it back to you is like it's really great it's really highly recommended ten out of ten. Have you? I think I, I I felt similar to that when somebody showed me a tattoo they got of my art. Oh yeah, in, in person, and I That's felt insane. a mixture. Oh my gosh, I felt a mixture of like, why would you do that? And <laughs> why didn't you ask so I could make it look better? Uh, but to them, obviously, you know, I see all the imperfections because I drew it and I hate everything I do. Sure. Uh, but then I saw it on someone's body, and I was like, no, actually, that's pretty great. Like you're like, whoa. Who, what was oh it was almond milk they got an almond with, oh, udder, right, an with udder the on it <laughs> and I was like that's on your calf dude you're at the gym like running on a treadmill and someone sees an almond with big pert udders anyway hey, they loved it yeah but yeah that same feeling of like what what <laughs> I literally left a mark on you I don't know yeah um, it's great yeah 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 don't dress up as my characters <laughs> I don't have any uh Anyway, so Jules Verne throws this party and people start coming in his as his characters. And so that was kind of the first documented from what I could tell somebody dressing as a fictional character in the sci-fi realm. That's super okay? cool. The next instance of what would could be considered early cosplay is is absolutely wild. It was in London in 1891 at okay. uh the Royal Albert Hall. And it's crazy okay. cuz this is like a convention. There's a map yeah. and everything. I'm going to First, I'm going to tell you what it's called. It's called the Vrilya Bazaar and Fete. So, uh, Vrilya. Vrilya. So, um, I'm going to send you a photo of uh, the map of this convention. So, it looks like an early Comic Con map where it has yeah. the booths. Big circle room. Big circle room. Um, there's one booth called the Krex Plunder, Zuzulia's Bazaar. <laughs> Uh, uh, Bra's booth, uh, Zuata of Sila. Sil- these sound like and Lord of the Rings characters. I know. Well, these are all from a book series by a dude named Edward Bulwer Lytton, and he wrote this book called The Coming Race. Which racism? Well, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate, I hate to say it, but we're in England in 1890. Yeah, and. I, I wouldn't Some necessarily say Edward Lytton is a racist, but I would say that it does cross over with a lot of people who had mm, some okay. racist views. So the novel, he, the, the the guy who wrote the novel, Edward Lytton, mm-hmm. he this novel is insane. It kind of reminds me of the Moon Hoax a little bit, uh, okay? Because the Vrilia were a race of humanoids featured Vrilia. in the book, okay. uh, and these creatures lived underground. They were driven out of Earth long ago. 
Uh, they live underground. They have wings, and they're telepathic, and they can use like magic. Cool. And the magic is used by drawing an energy source called Vril, V R I L, to okay. power their skills. And so, like, they feed on that underground, and then they can like zoom all over. What, like, pretty much like what? What exactly is Vril? I don't. It's like a goop. <laughs> It's not <laughs> like real. Gwyneth Paltrow yeah. is basically yeah. she's actually, <laughs> giving them all um, the energy that they needed. The there she's the she's the uh modern reincarnation <gasps> of uh the underground energy goop that No way. Yeah. So it, it's funny because she can fly. Uh <laughs> I've seen her wings. I mean it's hard to see because she's anyway, it doesn't matter. Um that's what kind of what it's about. And so that's like this okay. like, super master race that lives underground that can fly. So like there are some weird like ins and outs of is this racism or what is this mm. about and no one could really tell if it was satire. He he would like say it was satire and then but he would also lean into it and just like every troll online. Every I tro- didn't mean that terrible <laughs> thing that I said. It was right. just a joke. You're I'm just, just making fun of sensitive. society. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can't Boobs. say anything anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, a huge fan of this book was a dude named Henry Tibbets, which is the most British sounding name I've ever heard. Tibbets. Besides, uh, what's his name? Dick Pudleycott. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, Henry Tibbets was like, I'm going to throw a gigantic three day party in honor of these books. This book okay. that this guy wrote. And so he named it after the race in the book. And he, it was huge. Three days, people brought their goods to sell. They were like magicians there. There was costume people. And everybody came dressed as the characters from this book. Uh, you, know, you you could even argue that this is the first sort of comic convention, really. Kind of. Well, there wasn't much art. Like it wasn't art based. It's. I would mo- say it's more like the first sci-fi convention. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as we as we know conventions today. And sure. And, right. 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 And people were expected to wear costumes. Like the guy was like, wear costumes. Did whatever you want and a lot of people just went with like well there were some pretty racially insensitive ones of course because the people in the book were based on egypt egypt and egyptian culture and you know how they, they loved egypt back then in a way yeah, that egyptology was, they'd like eat mummies like psychopaths yeah i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> not the persian's yeah. fault that you did not learn how to translate I know. farsi correctly look in defense of my ancestors <laughs> just kidding there's no defense <laughs> <laughs> so we do every Thanksgiving. We unwrap a mummy in my family. Listen, it's it's healthy. It's protein, uh-huh. and it's not a lot of fat. It's great. It's, it's great. been cured. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gross. So people loved this book, especially people who were into like spiritualism. Because if you mm-hmm. remember at the time, spiritualism and the occult was really big. People were always like, "I gotta talk to the dead." And some some point, some people actually kind of started believing in Vril the actual energy source and thinking he based it on a real thing. Yep. And one, one of these people was very famous occultist, Helena Blavatsky. Oh, I remember Madame Blavatsky. Oh, That's yeah. right. Yeah. She I remember Madame Blavatsky. It's like the mother, the grandmother of the occult. She mm-hmm. influenced like the Thule society, the hermetic order of the golden dawn, all the occult stuff. If you want to, the Lima. Yeah. And then, um, the Rosicrucians, like you got to go yeah. listen to the last podcast series on her. Yeah. It they did a good series on it. I remember really that's good the one series. I learned all this stuff from, I almost found it fell down at Blavatsky all today. <laughs> what the Wow. Come on in. <laughs> yeah. The Blavatsky all. I almost, I was like, no, I can't read about the occult and I can't talk about it, but the Vril society is something that a bunch of Nazis were said to have founded. So, the Nazis make an appearance, of course. They just um, they ruin everything, man. Everything. You can't you can't have anything fun or like, you know, cheeky right. and just and it's like you gotta you can't you just ruin everything. Just, just a like, bunch of self serious nerds who Ugh. can also kill a lot of people. I Insufferable. hate that. Insufferable. I hate Hot that. Hot take. Yeah. Hot take. Nazis <laughs> suck. <laughs> Hot take. I don't like them. <laughs> Look at me. I'm Wonder Woman. I'll. I'll... Yeah, exactly. Oh, wait, Fighting those them. were that was World War One. I. I don't care. I'll kill. I'll kill. I'll kill baby Hitler. <laughs> no, I'm not going to teach him to be a better artist. I'm just going to kill a baby. It's... Okay, it's fine. Just chill, Hannah. <laughs> chill. Um. Anyway, so the word "vril" was so popular that it became used in everyday language as a as okay. a something to. 
that would be like a source of energy or power. So like, like the slang of their day, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's real. We should bring it back. That's <laughs> yeah. Real. Oh my god, that's so real. Unless people might think we're Nazis for saying it. But oh, you're right. <laughs> probably can't do that. <laughs> I'm I'm so sweaty. I can't think straight. <laughs> this thing is so tight on my head. It's squeezing my brain. I I just there's, gli- there's glitter on my face because I thought that would be cool. And now all I can see is glitter glinting on the corners of my eyes. Anyway, I don't feel right. I don't feel great. So <laughs> that's cosplay, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. <clears throat> so. Do you know Bovril? <laughs> Bovril? Yeah, it's like that no. meat paste that the British use. <laughs> anyway. Oh, dear Lord, no, I do not no, know that. It's, I don't know why I know about it. I've never had it, but the company decided to use bovine and vril and do Bovril. Oh, okay. They're and combining it two into one thing. Yeah. They like sold it at this convention. So I would call those two events protocons and proto cosplay. Okay. Fast forward to 1908. And right. people started attending gatherings and masquerades as a character called Mr. Skygack. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Skygack? Yeah. Are you ready for a picture of Mr. Skygack? Oh, God. I don't know if I am. I just so, think of like Nickelodeon Gack that they sold in the yeah. 90s. But like there's a person made out of it that's flying around. It's like a it's Superman true. character. So here is somebody dressed as Mr. Skygack. Um, <laughs> Whoa! He looks like a Star Wars like background character. Yeah, hundred percent. And it comes from a comic strip, actually, a cartoonist that created this comic strip called Mr. Skygack from Mars. And weird, the, the cartoonist was A. D. Condo, and he ran this strip in a Chicago newspaper for years. Mm-hmm. And it was um, about this like Mr. Skygack, this Martian who was sent to Earth to study humans, and just ends in like hilarious misunderstandings. And that sounds great. That's absolutely my jam. And it's almost like, you know, Nathan Pyle's Strange Planet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's almost like that, but like a hundred years earlier. That's uh, super, so it's it's super cool. Pretty much an alien being like, why do they do this? What? Yeah. And uh, for the next couple of years, people just kept dressing as Mr. Skygag because that was like pretty easy that's, costume. That's one to bring back. I like Mr. Skygag. This is fun. I think we should. you should dress as Mr. Skygag. I'm assuming the Nazis did not latch on to no, Mr. Skygag because they I don't have any of. kind of curiosity like this. They it's, have no creativity. That's the thing. Yeah. The thing is, is a character like this is fun because it just teaches you to be open minded and be like, oh, this yeah. is curious. Like you don't you don't you don't have any preconceived notions about what the world is. You just right. look at it for what it is. That's right. what's fun. And I think Nazis would probably try to kill all Martians if they were real. That's true. So. They would. Yeah. They'd, They'd be, be like, like what no. are your weapons? We need them. <laughs> but please, we're going to. Anyway, great. Hate them. Hate Nazis. <laughs> Over the next couple decades, costuming mm-hmm. began gaining in popularity in general because Halloween started to become this huge thing. Whereas yeah. before it was like, let's go get some caramel apples from someone and scream and yell about stuff. I yeah. don't know what Halloween was. What did they do? They just walked around. I don't night? actually even know when Halloween. This is going to be another tab for another day, but yeah. I'm not quite sure where it begins. <clears throat> I'm or say sure when it begins. The costuming part of it really took off between like 1920 and 1950 and so in the 20s people were like this is awesome i love dressing up as stuff and because that became more normalized and because of um super the dc comics and Mm -hmm. superheroes naturally people were going to start dressing as superheroes makes sense yeah batman and superman and there was also this like a very american pride like that came with these superheroes because we were at that point like, check us out. We're kind of, kind of like a world power now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? We invented this crazy art form that everybody loves. That everyone loves. I and... mean, we didn't even really invent it, invent no. it, but we popularized no. it. Popularized it. And so Batman wearing a cape and a mask looks a lot like some of the trope characters from those old carnival and, and, and masquerade yeah. balls. And I could see that. Yeah. There's a lot of, and also like early pulp stuff, like aliens and stuff, the cape. Anyway. Because of all of that, around 1939, the very first comic convention was held. Oh. 1939. So this is the most first official, what they called a convention. I didn't realize it was that early. I thought it was like Me New York was the first convention in like the 60s. It was. So this one was held in New York, and it was later known as Worldcon. And Worldcon oh, is still held. Oh, okay. So I've oh, never been. I didn't know that. Have you been to Worldcon? I have not been to Worldcon. Me neither. 
but it is the one where they uh, present each year's Hugo Award winners. So it's oh okay had that as part of it since fifties. So nineteen thirty nine, two hundred people gathered at this at, in New York. I didn't write down the venue, of course, but in New York, and two of the attendants were Myrtle R. Douglas and Forrest J. Ackerman. Now these two boyfriend and girlfriend, don't know. okay, they had met through the. <laughs> I don't either. Um, they had met through the Esperanto community. So do you know what Esperanto is? It, I th- feel like I should, but I'm drawing a blank. It's that like made up language that everyone was like, we should all speak this universal language. Oh, no, then that's not what I thought it was. No, I have no idea what Esperanto is. I've never that's heard a different that. tab. You got to read about it. It's wild. It's pretty okay. much like a made up new made up language that actually took off. Like there's people who speak in Esperanto as their first language. And um, these people were like total linguistics nerds. And also, okay. they loved sci-fi. So they met through this Esperanto community. I'm not going to really focus on Forrest Ackerman because up until recently, all of this was credited to him when actually okay. he barely did anything. Um, okay. So I'm going to put him aside. He's kind of in the background. And I'm going to focus on Myrtle. So Myrtle Douglas, and she she went by her Esperanto nickname, Ramorojo. So Ramorojo. Morojo. Morojo. Yeah, I looked up our Esperanto nicknames, and I think you'd be like Caveo or something. It's a stupid sentence. Real creative. Yeah, it's really not. <laughs> anyway, I'd stay as Hannah. It would be H-A-N-A, which I think is Is there disgusting. even another language? It's just like, it's Pig Latin or something. It, it is. Sounds like. <laughs> kind of, so you're like ca- Caveo or like Cavino. <laughs> Cavino's fun. I could go That's by Cavino. Fine. Hey, Cavino, how you doing? It sounds Italian. It does. Cavino. I don't know why, but... That's that makes that makes me happy. I like Cavino. I gotta don't look call up, me Cavino. Absolutely not. Uh, I wouldn't be able to without you know. Anyway, laughing so, every time. Yeah, okay. I, I got to calm down. Maybe you should tighten the band on your head a little bit more. I think, I think that would help. I think you're right. I think you're right. I appreciate your commitment to the bit, but at no point did you need to keep this headband on the entire time. It's fine. It doesn't matter. You've already sold the gag, but I like that you're just going through it. And you're going to go till the I'm, end. I, I will assume. not stop. Look, I got blue <laughs> eyeliner, too. I bought the blue eyeliner and lighter for pride. And now I get to wear it for this. Nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. For, for people listening to this and not watching the video, you could not see the sad, deeply sad <laughs> face that Hannah just made. How did you pick up on my immediate drop? Like my dopamine like plummeted. Because I'm watching a video of you. What do you mean? How did I pick up on it? I'm telling people who are listening. Okay, fine. Yeah, I felt a huge wave of sadness overtake me for no reason. All right? All that matters is cosplay. So, Cosplay. Morojo. Remember, Myrtle. This woman was dope. She was a solid, true, true fan of anything sci-fi. She was born in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, moved to L.A., and was like involved in all of this like local LA sci-fi meetups, uh, and she got into the zine scene, like making sci-fi oh, okay. fan zines. And so she and a few other women, because at the time men were like, "Get out of here, <laughs> we sci-fi's ours," you know, mm-hmm. um, wouldn't even let them into these like organizations. It was like men only, you know, gatekeeping doesn't happen. Very like that counterintuitive anymore. to me, right? <laughs> Very well, strange. To remind you, back then people literally thought we didn't use our whole brain, or our, our brain was like. Dumber. I just mean even even from like the chauvinist perspective, right? If right. you're like, well, Don't you there's women see that some, are like hot ladies yeah. in like Yeah, costumes? even if you're a douchebag, it's like, okay, we'll just let it I don't know. Maybe there's like a purity thing where they're like, We need to talk about sci fi. We don't want women ruining the vibe. I think there's that it's like a boys that's what club, it is. like we yeah. gotta talk about our little aliens that we made up and you know, Vril or whatever. The Vril will be off if these ladies come into our convention. They missed so. all the great conversations they could have been having about Alien 69ing on the moon. Right. I'm glad they're all dead, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, I have to take this headband off. <laughs> it's, it's it's not good. Oh, <laughs> Reset. I feel so much better. It was, okay, it was like squeezing my brain. Cutting off the circulation to your brain. Yeah. I keep thinking just insane things. All right. I already feel better. What in the world? 
it's okay, pushing so... all the insane ideas further into your brain. <laughs> further into like the, the 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 like base personality part of my brain. Yeah, <laughs> like makes me who I am. So I'll say it, say it, <laughs> say, say every death. weird thing. <laughs> Wish death upon bed. Um, so okay, the lady so is the at lady... the sci-fi conventions. So she Brug shows Brog, up. What was her name? <laughs> Br- Brick Brog. <laughs> Morojo. Morojo. Was a she made these zines and so she started these female only like zine cubs and her niece got involved whose name was Pogo. <laughs> <laughs> That's her niece Patty. Her these are ex- all the fake names, like the made the up Esperanto names. Esperanto names, yeah. Okay. So Pogo and Mo- Morojo. <laughs> <laughs> and then one other person joined and that would be um Lee Brackett. <laughs> And Lee Brackett was a sci-fi author, and she worked on the very first draft of The Empire Strikes, Strikes Back. So what? she, Yeah, so she and Pogo and Morojo were, like, hanging out together in the L.A. zine scene <laughs> and making these fanzines, sci- sci-fi fanzines, like, and distributing them. And so Morojo shows up in 1939 wearing a costume with her boyfriend, Forrest, right? And it wasn't based on any character in particular. She wanted to mimic like something that you would see in an H.G. Wells novel or something that you'd see in like sci-fi pulps and stuff like that. And so it's kind of like... This is like the spirit Halloween, like the type yes. costumes that they say, like <laughs> superhero. superhero type, quote unquote. And it's like a non-specific... Green superhero with mask. Yeah. Uh, let me get you a picture of uh, the costumes they showed up in. Okay, so here's Morojo wearing her uh her what looks like okay just a, a basic superhero costume like a cape There's a cape a, like a leotard ish kind of thing i mean you could also forgive this for being like uh uh there's a there's a disco or like yeah. a dance club that's in the shire and <laughs> she's dressed yes! up like a hobbit that's going out on the town with a cape and the shorts rave. and the outfit. A Hobbit rave or a Hobbit disco. Like a Hobbit roller disco. Hobbit roller, roller disco. Yeah, it does look like a Hobbit roller disco because she also has like dark curly hair, so it works. A good time. Yeah. Uh, I want to go to so, a, a, I wanna go to a yeah. disco with everyone dressed. So Hoju as shows up as a Hobbit roller disco. Yeah, Homer Jr. Um, and she made this costume and her boyfriend's costume. Um, okay. And they called these costumes... Futurist, Futura costumes. So, like the fut- font, like the typeface. I should say no. F- f- future, Futura costumes, like futuristic, but combined with costumes. Oh, f- oh, it's all one word. I see. It's yeah. A yeah. And there's so many portmanteaus in the Comic Con scene. And she said later, she was like, "I was surprised nobody else dressed up because it just felt natural." So okay. She just she wanted to express how much she loved sci-fi, and this was the first sci-fi convention. And so she started going to these every year, dressed as something different, and she made all of her costumes, and they were awesome. She One time she wore, like, a frog face costume Whoa. designed by some, like, kid who ended up going on to be, like, a, like a special effects artist. She was she, – so she and Forrest ended up breaking up because he didn't like how much she smoked. And uh, <laughs> she oh. – Yeah. And she uh, was like, whatever, dude – got married to someone else and she continued to create these costumes and be involved in zine making and conventions for nice. years she ended up dying when she was 60 something in her 60s um never really seeing what had come from all of what she'd done like she was damn the mother of cosplay and yeah a lot of things were taken like a lot of um credit was given to her boyfriend when really she was kind of the driving force behind all of it and mm-hmm. What I love about her is that she would go to these conventions just like now, and she would dress up and she would hand out her homemade zines to nice. all the different people there. And I thought that was awesome because people still do yeah. that. Uh, yeah. People are I, still doing it in LA, like Daisy will be talking about on yes. our panel on Saturday at 1 p.m. in Rune 28 DE talking about <laughs> how to build a zine community. It will be more organized than this, I hope. I hope not. I we got to give the people what they tight want. Headband. <laughs> Maybe you should. No. <laughs> anyway, I can't go into every cosplayer because that would take forever. There are okay. some amazing ones. So if you look up a lot of the cosplay, so they started having these um, the first cosplay contests at these conve- okay. at WorldCon in the fifth in the fifties, the forties and fifties. And so if you can go, you can go look at these photos of like 
uh, the winners of these con- costume contests and see how over mm-hmm. the years they get way more and more and more elaborate. Yeah. And we still do this every year. Every convention is a costume contest. We do it in San Diego. Yeah. The costume yeah. contest on Saturday night. <clears throat> the very first cosplay contest was hosted in Morojo's room. Like, oh. Yeah. In, in like the place she was staying. That's so uh, cool. I love yeah. it. Yeah. And so she, she was she was on the ground floor of all of this, just like pushing for it, pushing for it. Anyway, we owe oh, cosplay the, the popularity of it to her. She was totally fearless. I love her. And I want to dress up as her cosplaying. Okay. That sounds um, like a good idea. So I'm almost done. In 1970s, people started mm-hmm. just coming naked to conventions. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess in San Francisco. Yeah, absolutely. LA, yep. New York. Uh, and a lot of it was like topless. You know, it's like being an alien, but with like tits yeah. out. No, oh, and- <laughs> I don't believe in your modern conventions of exactly. clothing. I am an alien. Uh- and they started getting <laughs> hot, hot alien chick. They started getting kicked out because they were like, actually, this is not great. <laughs> like, it's a bit much. Because obviously people can't keep their hands to themselves. Yeah. Or they even fully clothed. It's like half right. the signs at Comic-Con are always like cosplay does not mean consent. Do yes. not go up and touch people. This is where that came from. This was the root of that is they started being like, because of all the nudes, <laughs> they started being like, don't touch anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and we still see that now. And then. Now we get to 1974. 1974. Uh, oh, uh oh. I got a fact check. Just a second. Richard Nixon shows up nude to a yeah, convention. He's there. So naked. Mar- he's just dressed with two giant black blobs on him to look like a Chinese panda. <laughs> I bet it would be way more racially insensitive. Than he's that. all, oh, look at me shitting on the ground, getting into character because <laughs> I'm just like a panda. Does. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Hey, give me some gets- more bamboo. <laughs> And then he gets absolutely destroyed by Nikola Jokic. I absolutely would love to see naked Richard Viking. Nixon at Worldcon dressed up as a panda with body paint. Think of that image as you share us um, with your next fact. I can't focus on anything else now. <laughs> so. so the first San Diego Comic Con, which is now yeah. one of the world's largest, was in 1970. Yeah. So I did not know that it was that old. I thought it was like yeah. the 80s or something. I thought it is the world's largest. I didn't know if there's no. anything bigger than this one. Japan has has one that has now overtaken. A convention or, or a comic convention? A cosplay summit. So, yes, it's the biggest cos- comic yeah, convention. Yeah, it's the biggest comic convention is yeah. San Diego. Yeah. So 1970 was the first one and it was pretty sparse, you know, and they've had their first costume contest in 74. And so mm-hmm. uh, then Japan was like, this is dope. Because yeah. they already had like a lot of like costuming for like theater and stuff like that, and they naturally were also making a lot of like media, yeah. And it made sense that they were just like, we're gonna go full blown. We're gonna get so deep into this that we're gonna make yeah. it seem like we started it because that's kind of yeah. what I thought. They especially got into Gundam costumes, like making their own. Oh, the Gundam, Gundam costumes. ones are crazy. Yeah. So their first times they were doing this in Japan, they would come with yeah. these like out. I mean, amazing Gundam costumes. Yeah. And, um, but so then they also. For those of you who don't know, Gundam oh. is like those crazy ass giant robot. They built like yeah. a massive Gundam robot in Japan a couple years ago. They uh, did. That's right. Yeah. That but could, like, it's, it's be... really like, yeah. Sp- like kind of weird, sp- not, not spiky, but like these like insane angular designs. That yeah. Are, it's, it's pretty ornate. I don't want to say Transformers, but like. I mean, that's probably the closest structure. analog you could think of. Yeah. But yeah. So Japan got into the Gundam stuff and also just making it super sexy. Yeah. So uh, and then, of course, the Japanese government was like, they're everyone around is really upset with all the sexiness. So tone it down. Uh, And they didn't. Don't worry. Good. So the first cosplay cafe app opened in Japan, 1989, where everybody who who was like waitressing there would be dressed Mm -hmm. as characters. Okay. And then in 2003, uh, the first cosplay summit Dangeki Layers becomes the largest gathering of cosplay. I like that it's a summit because I just think yeah. of like the UN where they're all like <laughs> cosplay representatives from every country on earth gets together and they discuss what will be done in the Middle East to solve this war using cosplay. Oh my gosh, imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh. This is 2003? Yeah. Yeah, so they're we discussing were... the Iraqi invasion, like Operation Iraqi Freedom. They're yes. just like, what is to be done with Saddam once he is captured? Uh... Shall he be cosplayed as a Gundam or shall he be cosplayed <laughs> shall he be as hung? a Lord of the Rings character? When we hang him, will he be dressed as yeah. Gandalf? 
That was the first live. I thought that was the first execution I ever saw. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, that's my tab. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had more, but I don't. So <laughs> classic. That's excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So. Turns out cosplay is way older, of course, and it's such a natural thing for us to want to dress up as something else that it makes complete sense why it's so popular. It's interesting that it can be traced back in the modern age to one specific person. I think that's really fascinating, too, actually. And she deserves like so much credit. She got so erased for so long. So Myrtle Douglas Morojo. Myrtle Douglas Morojo. Salute. We salute you and your cosplaying abilities and for bringing this... To the masses. I want to say, I really yeah. appreciate cosplay. Like, I, I did before. I was impressed. But, like, after doing this, I'm like, oh, this is, like, a full-blown movement and art form that's really cool. My uh, my favorite is, like, f- much like everything is, like, I like cosplay that's, like, dumb and funny. Me too. Uh, like more your friend than... that came as <laughs> Moo Moo Homer. Oh, my God. She's on our Discord. She is? What? Oh. Yeah. Uh, oh. So... We had one of our listeners who thankfully is on the Discord, which you should sign up for if you haven't. Uh, she it. was pregnant. I don't know how far along she was, but she was, you know, quite, she had a, you know, the belly and she was pregnant like so, a certain amount of months along. And she was like, I'm just going to wear this muumuu and just turned it into Homer when he was trying to get on disability and <laughs> work he from home gains home a bunch Homer. of weight. Work from home, Homer. I, <laughs> I think I was like. I couldn't breathe. I was laughing so hard. I was like, that's the funniest. And she had the cape and like the white beret. It was it was amazing. I was like, that's the greatest cosplay I've ever seen in my entire life. It was so good. It was so funny. Uh, I've seen some really funny ones over yeah. the years, but that's the one that really stands out to me is, is I love when they do uh, the, the creative aspects of when you combine either like, you know, in that case where like you're literally feeling like bigger because you're pregnant and you incorporate that yeah. into the cosplay or kind of what you were saying, like the... You're saying your friend uh, Griffin was yeah. doing the post-apocalyptic uh, Ash, Pokemon, which is not yeah. or Pokemon. Yeah, yeah. So it's like that's not necessarily a thing that exists in the world of that media, but you can sort of combine them into a special thing that's unique yeah. and really interesting. I like seeing that, like a lot of that stuff too. Me too. Me too. Oh, my, I saw this one where. Do you ever played Fallout? Uh, a little bit, but I watched the show, which oh, okay. was I really I really enjoyed the show. So. Uh, I think at Emerald City a couple of years ago, this guy came mm-hmm. to the booth and he had one of the most beautiful handmade Fallout costumes, like the armor. Mm-hmm. And he had a working Pip Boy in his arm, and it oh, played, that's cool. like the music sounded like all crackly, just like it does in the game. And like everything about it was spot on. And it took my, it took my breath away. I was like, oh my god, you did this? Yeah, that's awesome. And he was it's like, oh yeah, that- yeah. <laughs> yeah, these are all people who could probably, if they were able to, move to well, not LA because no one has work in LA anymore. But Mm-mm. you could be working in like the in film, like that's basically oh, yeah. like costume department or props or anything. Like that's the kind of shit that they. But do, they're instead so. they're like, I'm a pro, they're I'm a software engineer, doing it for fun. Yeah, <laughs> I just do this in my spare time. <laughs> in spare time, it's <laughs> so strange. Anyway, uh, what do you? Anyway, have? that's awesome. That's really interesting. Thank you for that tab. Yeah. Uh, let me pull. Took it my up. wristbands off so I don't lose my mind. So uh, let's I be real be here. That's implying that you had it at the beginning. No, you're right. We oh, all you're know right. that you didn't. <laughs> you're right. My tab. So as usual, I was doing all my brainstormy research for this episode, and I went down a couple of different tabit holes, as we uh-huh. like to say, trying to think of something interesting. I was like, maybe the history of San Diego Comic Con, but it wasn't. There was nothing that crazy and like insane about it uh, in terms yeah. of how it would relate to this show. And it didn't really leap out at me. So I started to think a little bit more broadly about comic conventions and the convention scene and, and kind of what they're about and what people come for. And um, cool. But one of the things I was thinking of is like, why do you even go to conventions? Right. And a big part of it is it's because because a lot of stuff you can buy online. Right. Right. And so you're like, well, why would I go pay money to go to a convention to buy something? And a lot of it ends up being this thing that we keep talking about. It's community. It's meeting yeah. people. And. Uh, this seems like somewhat of an older relic, but it's still really relevant, which is um, getting autographs. Oh. Autographs are like a huge cornerstone of of conventions, particularly for celebrities and creators. Like you go, yeah. you get a signed photo of somebody or you go and you take your book or your drawing or whatever and you get them to sign yeah. it. People make money off of it that way. Or um, they bring like I've seen people bring sketchbooks around and have. Yes. Artists like I'll, I'll like draw like a little thing. Yes, I've had that too. A lot of too. times they're like, do whatever you want. I'm like, okay, hope you know what you're getting yourself into. I'm about so to draw many dicks. a Care I've seen Bear you draw. with no face. So yeah. let's do it. So I have drawn a lot of things. Um, but yeah, those those I always think that's kind of cool. It's like this like collection of 
tiny art or tiny. Yeah. Anyway, cool. Yeah. And people get crazy. Like they'll wait in line for like hours. Yeah. Just to get like an autograph, which is insane to me because if I have to wait in a line for longer than Mm-mm. 30 seconds, I spontaneously combust and it. catch on fire. <laughs> Um, I lose my mind. Yeah. If I ever have to go to an ER for any emergency, if I have uh, to wait longer than five minutes, I'm like, just, I'm dead. Forget it. Don't even bother. Just kill um, me. Just lay, just, just lay me down. Don't even rescue just me. Throw me in the bog. But I digress. But I digress. And so, had the subject of today's tab been alive today, jo- Yosef, or sorry, uh, let's see, he's Yoja Mikulec. Okay. Would have been perfectly at home here in San Diego waiting to meet oh. Lou Ferrigno or the Hobbits or whoever. So get this, okay. over the span of his life, this Croatian farmer traveled close to 175,000 miles on foot and oh. gathered nearly 60,000 signatures <laughs> in a comically large leather-bound album that weighed 60 pounds. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, this sounds like a modern day like pilgrimage or something. It's exactly what it is. Oh, he is my goodness. What was his name? Yos- the, Yosha? Yoshi? Yoshi? Yo- Yoja Jojo. Mikulec. Jojo. That's what ex- <laughs> I exactly wrote down Jojo. Jojo. Nichols, That's funny. Yeah. So I'm going to send you a picture of... I'll spoil this up front just so you can see the book. And of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to see the size of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that looks like a tome from like a fantasy show. Uh-huh, like you go uh-huh. into the like restricted section of the library and learn a dark spell from that's that that's a huge book. It's oh it's huge. It... <laughs> it's like <laughs> it looks like it looks like an AI version of the Bible. Yeah. Does that make it's... sense if you told like Chat GPT or whatever to draw the Bible, it would make this big insane thing. It looks like a parody if you were like, yes. like create like a prompt of like a book that's longer or that's taller than it is long or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It, it looks like a cartoon. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. Let me tell you the story of okay. Joža Mikolec. So Joža Mikolec was born into a family of poor farmers on January 15th, 1878 in the village of Krušlevo Selo, Croatia, which okay. is near the capital of Zagreb. He may have been born into that farming life, but from a young age, he he was way too restless and Uh he wanted to see the world. He was like, I am not about that 5 a.m. milking life. Mm -mm. I hate that. And unfortunately for him, his father was in debt, Oh, uh, probably because he went to USC film school and got a master's foolishly. Yeah, Um, who would do that? (laughs) (laughs) So he sent. He sent old Jojo to go work off that debt on a different farm. So he wasn't even working on his own farm. He was oh. working on a different farm so he can help pay off his dad's debt. Wow. And 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 that sucked just even worse. So much. That's horrible. Yeah. I'd feel like such a piece of crap. Be like, I'm not even making money. I'm just paying off my dad's paying debt. Paying off my dad's debt. He's like, eat shit. I hate this. So <laughs> before he was even 20 years old, Joseph, Joseph's like, absolutely not. And he went and talked to his dad and he's like, I want to go see the world. And his dad's like, nope, you cannot. We have debt. Also, outside world is scary, I imagine. Remind um, me the year. Uh, it's it's around this time. It's probably like 1900-ish. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. He went and he's like, cool. Dad said, no, I'm going to go talk to my mom. And his mom was like, all right, cool. Yeah, whatever. Go. Don't. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good, good mom. Yeah, which is an important reminder that if you are parents, you need to be unified. On the same how page. You, on the same page. You can't have one parent because then it undermines the authority of the other. Oh, yeah. But anyway, JoJo's like, cool. And he says, quote, I always wanted to see the world. And this is the path I took to do that. So he traveled to Italy and then to Malta where he got a job. Cool. I don't know what this job is. There's no information about it. But so I'm going to say this up front. There's only like a couple of sources about this man's life. Okay. Uh, So a lot of the chronology is unclear. It's kind of a mess. And it kind of reminded me of when we were doing, or when I did the episode that was about um, Thomas Edison and the founding and the, and the camera. And I was going insane. Because it was like nothing made sense. Everything made sense at the same time. It was all over the place. And and like a lot of the sources were weird. So this is, and again, it's also around the same time. So it's very similar in that sense. So I did. Oh, wow the adult thing and I said you know what I'm not going to focus on all the dates and I'm just going to tell the story as coherently as possible and here I come being like what what time when yeah (laughs) yeah I needed exact (laughs) dates uh so I think I think what happens this is my best I can do to extrapolate so when he's in Malta he gets distracted and then he hops on an (laughs) English steamboat 
Yeah, exactly. He's like, what? He sees a butterfly. He follows and he hops, it. <laughs> he follows it. He goes onto this steam bo- this English steamboat, and it's on its way to South Africa. Oh. So <laughs> it Ooh. sailed for 35 days and ended up in Port Elizabeth. Okay. And he gets there, and he's like, oh, this is cool. I don't know. Maybe he sees, like, some great white sharks or whatever. I don't know. Whatever he sees in South America in South Africa that's happening at that time at the turn of the century. And, yeah, there's nothing, a war. Some, nothing bad. Yeah, nothing bad. <laughs> and he's like, all right, cool, whatever. Then he gets distracted again, and he hops on another <laughs> boat. I love this guy. <laughs> and on this boat, he crosses the Atlantic, and he goes to South America. You realize that this would be us. If we didn't have the internet, like this would be me. I'd be like, ah, I gotta, yeah. I gotta get away. I gotta just yeah. walk somewhere. Like I would end yeah. up places. I've been yeah. here for two months. This is boring. This is boring. But instead, I need a new I just, dopamine source. I, I just my it's, I replace it with just reading endless tabs. It's true. Wow. So he's like, whatever, cool. So he hops on the boat and he goes to South America, where he's camping in the rainforest and he Ooh. visits Buenos Aires. <laughs> And shortly after, he went to Brazil, where he lived for about six months. And among this time, he got robbed a few times. Yeah. And at one point, he got lost in the rainforest and ate you wild know. fruits, roots, and nuts. <laughs> this reminds and me he of almost Felix. died. <laughs> yeah, me, honestly. This reminds me of Felix Carvajal from the They are kindred marathon. spirits. They are. Kindred spirits, him and Felix. So, yeah. again, not clear in the timeline. I cannot figure out exactly how this happened because it's not clear. Uh, but at some point, apparently he goes back to Croatia in this period. And I assume to either visit family or whatever. But like, again, it's 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 very clear that this man is like, I don't care. I'll just hop on whatever yeah. boat. And he's like, he's tumbling around and going to different places. So cool. Or maybe he's traveling a bunch and he sweet talked his way into this next part. I'm not sure. But this is really a story that happens in two parts. So, okay. Uh, Again, for reasons that no one can source, he had entered into an agreement with. Uh, I want <laughs> that. Say? I want that part of my biography after I'm dead. If anyone ever writes about me, just say we don't have a source for why she did this. That's what I want. That's what they did. That's the way. So, that's the way to live. Somehow, he enters into an agreement with Matika Hravatska, which okay. is a Croatian cultural and publishing society in Zagreb, which I think it's still around. Oh, cool. Uh, and he enters into an agreement with them to hike 25,000 miles in the course of five years. And what to kind give of them. What agreement is that? <laughs> hey, we want you to hike for five years. Well, this is what no, they do. Thank so they... You. No, thank you. No, It's like my dad uh, being like, we're just going to go on a little walk. And before I know it, we're like six miles into a hike. And I'm like, this is a 25,000 miles dad. later. Every time I fall for it. <laughs> now I know. He gives them exclusive rights to a memoir that he would deliver <laughs> upon the completion of his journey. And Matika, in return, would reward him with 50,000 crowns, which I guess at the time was about $10,000, oh, and publish it. Not bad. So it's like a. Tr- he basically says, I'll do this hike. I'll write this book. You guys can publish it. And they're like, cool, we'll give you money. And additionally, it is unclear as to why the agreement, uh, the agreement stipulated this, but he couldn't beg... So he had to support himself by selling postcards with his picture on them. Oh, <laughs> he would have fit in at Comic Con. Yeah, that's literally all like, I do. I'm like, want a comic that I drew myself into? <laughs> so I mean, I think in some way this is almost like a the reality show of kind of of its day, <laughs> where they're like, this guy's gonna go across the world. He's gonna walk. He's gonna sell postcards of himself, and then he writes a memoir about it, and then you watch a TV show. But it's the early 1900s, yeah. so you need a book. Yeah. And Ugh. also, as part of this, he had to send back updates once a week on his progress, like light, <laughs> write little like progress reports. Quote, mine is not a college education. I could neither read nor write when I left Croatia. <laughs> but travel is the greatest educator, in which case he is true. It is very yeah. much true. Oh, yeah. Um, so he grabs, you know, a stack of MREs and a hot pink Barbie branded Stanley <laughs> Cup and he puts on his hokas and then he heads off. And he's going to all these different places. But listen, you know what we are? We're Americans. We're Yankees. Yeah, we are. That's all that matters to us. We don't walk so, anywhere. We don't care. Oh, no. I was going to say the relevant part of the story is when he comes to America. Because oh, okay. We like, we, our autograph- <laughs> <laughs> we like our autograph-seeking journeyman domestic. Yeah. We don't want those foreigners. He better change his name when he gets here or else we won't care. Which, of course, he does. Or does at least- really? He doesn't change his name, but people are like, I can't pronounce your name. You're Joseph or Jojo, as you said earlier. 
Oh, whoa. Okay. So co- contemporary newspaper accounts suggest that Mikolic arrived in America for his first cross-country trek in 1908. Whoa. Uh, and that's the fun part. When he gets to the U.S., all these people want to write articles about him. Because oh, nice. he's just like this chatty Cathy and he's willing to talk to anybody about his goal. And, you know, he's not like us. He's really good at self-promoting. He's like, yo, like and subscribe to my wow. channel, support the Patreon. You'll get exclusives like this postcard with a picture of me on it. Go to my link tree. Go to my link tree. <laughs> Check out our fans. Go Hit to that, our podcast. Smash that bell. Uh, <laughs> subscribe. Go to my OnlyFans. It's Go just to my me OnlyFans. walking. It's- <laughs> Because this is America. We love a hustler trying to make a buck. That's the thing that we love most. Yeah, we don't have a choice. And attired in a sweater of purple and bright yellow and oh. wearing heavy brown leggings, he attracted considerable attention. Yes. He but- was a teetotaler and a vegetarian. Hey, like me. Yeah. Uh, Mikolic also played the bugle and carried a <laughs> knapsack. <laughs> yes. Okay. I love him. I love this band. Yeah. He played the bugle and carried around a knapsack containing a scrapbook that is filled with press notices and autographs, although this was not yet the monstrous chunky boy he'd become to known for just yet. That is a chunky this, boy. That was, this, this is like his walk through beta my trip. town with a ba- bugle wearing a purple and yellow outfit. Mm-hmm. I'd follow him. And a bugle, yeah, just being like. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> By the time he beats the Oregon Trail and makes it across the U.S., uh-huh. it's around 1911. Oh, wow. Three years. Yeah, three years. That's just the American leg of the trip. Don't forget, he's done all this <laughs> no, other stuff. No. Okay. And, you know, he's yucking it up on like every morning show along the way. And there's so many articles <laughs> written about him at the time that somebody did take a proper, uh, someone made like a Google map. Remember kind of like how we have, yeah. by the way, we have one for our show which is a Google map that indicates on the map all the places that uh, we've talked about for different episodes. Uh, yeah. Somebody did this for all the spots that he hit in like the order on his first uh, walk through America. Oh, that's cool. I'd love to see that. Uh, I'll, I'll connect the, I'll, I'll link it into the show notes. Okay. So he was dubbed an earth circler, a globe girdler, oh. and the champion <laughs> long distance walker of the world. <laughs> globe girdler? It sounds gross. <laughs> I'm a globe girdler. <laughs> Girdling the globe everywhere I can. I don't like I the can. word girdle. Let's just get, like let's end it. <laughs> I love this uh, man. <laughs> I, 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 I wish this were now and I could meet him. I mean, I'm sure somebody's trying to do this, maybe. Nah, it's all for um, like attention. I guess that's what he did it too. Never mind. Yeah. Go on. A Boston area shoe company used his name and likeness to sell rubber soles. Yeah. Yeah. They were just marking it off at him. But again, don't forget, he is not yet the autograph king. Wait, yeah, He what's going was on? in his finding himself after college traveling phase. During this trip, he managed to track down President William T- Howard Taft, Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, he wasn't president oh. yet, and 48 governors before setting sail from California bound for Australia in 1911. Whoa. From there, For-, he spent, Did what he get the, say? Sorry. their autographs? It's like he was like meeting them and, and, and getting autographs? So or? at this time, yeah, I think I, uh, I I might mention this later, but he's he's just getting like letters from people being like, yeah. can you write me a letter saying that we met? And he's just getting scraps and like it's it's for it's very informal at this point. Yeah. OK. And um, after he leaves in 1911, he spent the next three years going through New Zealand, the Philippines, Japan, China, Singapore, Burma, India, oh. Egypt, and Europe, collecting the signatures of diplomats and dignitaries along the way. Wow. I think, again, I can't confirm. I think this is the the time where he roughly goes to Italy. Okay. And there he sees a dude carrying an autograph book. And he's like, oh, that's cool. I should do that. I should make like an omnibus and like have it all collected into like one area. He's, he's, uh, you know, he's inspired. So he goes yeah. on, you know, Amazon and he searches for a gigantic ass autograph scrapbook yeah. and he gets it delivered same day to an Amazon locker because he doesn't live anywhere. And no. when he gets it and he's like, cool. But then this is 1914. Oh, World War One breaks uh-oh. out. He's right in the middle of it. And he's like, shit. So <laughs> <laughs> he takes off his. Whatever goofy hat he's wearing, it throws yeah. it on the ground. And he's like, I can't travel now. So he's forced to take a break for a couple Aww. of years. And he was not happy about that. No. It just sucks. I don't know what he's doing here. No one seems to. <laughs> but 
<laughs> oh, what you have to remember here is is that he was supposed to be sending little snippets of chapters and whatnot yeah. back to Matika. He, and he didn't. Hilariously, the details here are also <laughs> scant. <laughs> but long story short, he just sort of stops mentioning it to anyone. So Man the of, thought... <laughs> he's, he's one of us. He's one of us. He's Sorry, absolutely one of us. Sorry, Alyssa. He's one of us. Oh. And so the thinking is that they were like, uh, yeah, this they probably saw it. Or maybe he just forgot to send. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> something happened and they were like, the deal is <laughs> off. No. But this this is our boy. He's not, he's not going to back down. No, he won't stop. He's like, screw it. And so uh World War is World War One is Hundo Dunzo. And mm-hmm. he's like, I'm I'm reinvigorated. So he gets back on the road. He's just been yeah. aching for this for years. And he needs to make some cash. He needs to make some green. <laughs> so <laughs> he takes what he's learned and he applies it to like this business plan. And much like every rock and roll band after six months, he's just like, I need to go back on another world tour. Mm-hmm. That'll and work. So, I'm going to call this one, this is Born to Autograph 1919 is what his second world tour is going to be. <laughs> and this tour, this time around, his autographs become the main attraction. Cool. And instead of selling postcards as his primary source of income, he's hosting presentations based on the places that he has visited and the people he had met. He's smart. Whoa. He has sowed the seeds and he's going to go harvest the crop. Oh, that's genius. And don't for, don't forget, he would go to all these places, and they would people people were just writing articles they, about him. They knew him already. Yeah, yeah. they Whoa. knew him. They're like, oh, this dude already did all this, so he's like, I'm gonna go on my book tour now, and he just like used these articles as like ways to get into the door and like sort of do this additional marketing. It's it's actually pretty genius. Yeah, that's really cool. And it's it's weird because at this point he's sort of like famous for being famous. <laughs> Kardashian. That's exactly what I wrote. He's just like the Kardashian of his day. But way more fun, I think. Way more fun. And also, most importantly, now he has this giant chunk of an autograph book. The thing is then this thing I is, can't it tell is you guys beast. how big it is. It's huge. It's like, how tall do you think that thing is? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, here's, here's some pictures of him that I think you'll enjoy. Again, okay. if you're watching it on YouTube. <laughs> You can see him slinging it over his shoulder oh, to carry my. it. <laughs> it's bigger than I even thought. <laughs> I, th- I was picturing something that was still kind of small and tall, but this yeah. thing is gigantic. It's like bigger than a suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like got it on his shoulder. It looks like he's carrying it. Like It looks like he's like like a farmer carrying an animal. Yep. Don't forget, he is a farm boy. That's right. Look at him. Look at his. Oh, he's awesome. Yep. Kind of looks like my dad. <laughs> Everyone looks like your dad. He's a bearded white man. Yeah. That's true. Uh, and so remember, at first he had a, lot, a bunch of loose papers that he was collecting. Yeah. But by the time he gets this book, he sort of the front section of it, I think, is like all the letters and stuff that he had gotten. He kind of puts them in there and whatever, oh, yeah. glues them or sews them. Yeah. And then once those are all all those pages are filled, he starts to just get people to write directly on the pages into the book. And this is such a cool again, picture. It's I'm super still, cool. Yeah. And uh, also, OK, so this is another funny thing. Eventually, it's it's so heavy. It's like at least 60 pounds that he he has to get like this. What can be best described as like a stroller, like an old timey <laughs> stroller to carry it around? <laughs> it, it is a stroller. Look at that. Oh, what? Who is it? Who's signing that? Is that Roosevelt? No, that's no, Roosevelt. No, I forget who it is. Uh, it's not a president, though. Oh, he does not look like my dad. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. He looks Whoa. like a bald John Muir or something at this point. <laughs> he does. He looks like a haggard John Muir, yeah. And he's stroller. just, he's going for it. He's not yeah. backing down. He's going everywhere. He's filling the pages. He's just getting everybody to sign it and like write little notes. It's almost, uh, you know, it's almost weirdly kind of like a giant yearbook too. It's yeah. a really strange thing to think about. But uh, autograph, 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 autograph. 60,000 you said, right? Yep. Yeah. That and is wild. he's speaking at like whatever, Goldman Sachs and BlackRock and Plessing Person <laughs> Flesh with VIPs. No, I'm kidding. Where's that place with the big like effigies that they burn? Oh, uh, the one with the owls? Yeah. Oh, um, uh, something. Why am I drawing a blank? It's on near it. me. 
It it's, is. Uh, I, don't I know what Bohemian Grove. That's the word. He's over in Bohemian Grove, getting like the signature of like d- the devil himself. I don't know. Listen, it's, it's funny you should say that because he does. So I think we're well, not Carnegie. One of them. One of them. Oh, uh, okay. So I went through the list of people that he signed. It's too long. There's no point in even trying to read them on here because uh, literally it's sixty thousand. So <laughs> a lot of famous people get sign it. A lot, a lot of people. But you can look at the show notes, and I'll I'll post the okay. link to one of them that has them if you're interested. Do you have examples, though, like of who, like you said, Carnegie and like most people, like the president and stuff? <clears throat> I can read you a little excerpt. Let's see. Okay. Among the presidential figures he visited and contributed were Theodore Roosevelt and Edith Kermit Roosevelt, William oh. Taft, like I said, Woodrow Wilson, Edith Bowling Wilson, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover. Whoa. Vice President Thomas Marshall, presidential nominees Charles Evan Hughes, Al Smith, William oh. Jennings Bryan, cabinet members William... G. Makuto, Josephus Daniels, Robert Lansing, Andrew Mellon. Whoa. Um, so like everybody. See. Literally everybody. Uh, that's just in America. Um, don't Why? forget all the people like overseas. We're going to spend the next six hours reading every single name. Yeah, like I said, th- so. it's going to go forever. <laughs> uh, Admiral Togo, Admiral Saito Makoto. Whoa. The general gover- the governor of Hong Kong. Uh, F. H. May, Li Yuan Huang, President of China, Tsi oh uh, Lang, Viceroy of Manchuria. It just basically, dude's seen like everybody, everybody, everybody. And That's so eventually, cool. he gets to do. He's like almost fifty, which shocking. I guess that you look at this man's 50? picture. You're like, he looks like he's yeah. eighty. He does look very old here. He's but not looking. He's haggard. Good. You know, he's not like. He's been walking. Yeah, he's and aged his body quite a bit. Yeah. Don't forget, even just being in the sun. Yeah, being in the sun, like, not taking, he's not putting yeah. on lotion. He's not getting no. beauty rests. He's not, but he's happy. He's like, he's got good spirits and he's just, he's in good spirits. He's jovial. He's bouncing around, but he's sort of like, dude, my back hurts. I've been carrying around this 60 pound. I'm 50. I'm 50. I'm going to die. What the shit is this? <laughs> and he doesn't want to do it anymore. And he wants to cash out. Oh, so okay. So he sets out for the Rosenbach Rare Bookstore in New York in an attempt to sell his autograph book. And okay. his main reason for doing this was he wanted to make money and try and settle down because he wasn't able to get it from the, the, the fake book that he was going to sell and it never right. ended up happening. He's And he's been living like this nomadic lifestyle, I assume. Like Yeah. Um, and I love this fact. Originally, he wanted to sell it for $1 million. <laughs> oh, how, but how event- optimistic. <laughs> But eventually it was like, whatever, I'll just take 10 grand. I don't care. Just get this shit away from me. My back hurts just looking at this. He doesn't even want to see it anymore. He's like, get it away. 10 and grand. Dr. Rosenbach was like, you know, this is cool as shit. Like, no doubt. Like, I love it. It's awesome. But I don't have anyone that will buy this because I sell used books. I don't sell autographs. There was no right. like autograph, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, what are they Market. called? Market. Market. Yeah. But he's like, you should do what you should do is go west and see if Henry Huntington might be interested. Oh, of the Huntington Museum, right? Yeah, like of the library and that. And he, Jojo just does this face palm. He's like, yeah. Oh, nice. One of my favorite places in all of yeah, Los Angeles, the Huntington Library. Okay, so and <laughs> Jojo, Jojo goes face what? palms. He's like, oh, shit, damn it. I actually did meet that guy and he Ooh. signed the book, but I didn't think to try and sell it to him. <laughs> Idiot. So he's like, crap. <laughs> <laughs> this guy doesn't plan ahead. Let's face it. Ab- absolutely not. He didn't think about selling this until he decided to sell it. And so eventually he does find a buyer. His oh. name is Samuel Robinson, okay. who co-founded American Stores Company, which later became Acme Markets, which is now part oh, yeah. of the Albertsons grocery business. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Albertsons, man. Did you ever live near an Albertsons? Of course. Okay. I forget what Albert was Albertsons lucky before it became Albertsons. I forget all um, these purchases and, and and conversions of confused I think the it, shit out of me. I think Lucky bought Albertsons, and then it became it was not Lucky for a while, and then it became yeah. Albertsons again. I don't know, whatever. I it's just all know that our Albertsons was one of the scariest places in town. Oh really? I didn't know that. It was something was off there. The vril was off. The Vril was off in Albertsons. Not enough goop products from Gwyneth Paltrow. The Vril is off in this Albertsons tonight. (laughs) But he sells the book. He sells it. And on May 28th, 1924, Mikulich composed a handwritten receipt stating that Robinson had paid him $2,500, which for that time, that's around $41,500 today Uh, for his autograph book. Still not enough, but yeah. I mean, it's priceless, honestly. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, what was and, uh, yeah, exactly. And just like the genie at the end of Aladdin, the cuffs come off <laughs> he's and he's free. free. <laughs> he's free of his own self-made prison. Highly relatable. Absolutely. Look at <laughs> A us. A prison of our own making. We thought that we were going to close tabs doing this podcast. Never. Uh, Never. I just sent you another picture of him sitting next to the book. Holy cow. I'm still like blown away by how huge this book is. Look at him. So here's just a couple of pictures of both. <clears throat> and again, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're not Whoa, listening, if you're like listening pictures. to this on YouTube, we'll show you pictures of it. Yeah. So you can see the first oh, yeah. section that's like the cutout stuff, like the scrapbook part of it. And then oh, I actually yep. included that one for you where they actually Lance, signed directly the Prince into of it. Wales, yeah. There you go. That was for you. Thanks. Except he's not in the true Prince of Wales because he's a little freaking. You know? Anyway, don't ruin the, the nice White gesture House, that I made. Washington. Oh, yeah. Look, there's Edith Balling Wilson. Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. Got to make sure. What's over here? Oh, this is so cool. Look at this. Oh, it's, I want to look through awesome. this. It's awesome. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Name. Uh, I place my name. With great pleasure, I place my name in Mr. Joseph Mikulovich's whatever book. On his journey around the world with my best wishes. Harry w- Warden? Oh, this is cool. Yeah. Oh, oh there's so more. Oh, my all gosh. these autographs. Yeah. There's, oh. there's a ton of them. Is that Arabic so, up there? It looks like it, yeah. Yeah. Boston Traveler. Wow. It's all these. This is so cool. He like put all these like uh, the articles about him in every language. Stamps. Oh, he, by the Viceroy of Manchuria himself. President yeah. of China wrote a big letter. This is nuts. Isn't it cool? Yeah. So funny oh. part is <laughs> once it's sold, people are like, we don't care anymore. We're not going to write no. articles about this guy. No one has any idea. So his death and the rest of his life is like whatever. Like maybe he got married. Like no, there's no record. No, no one, one knows, knows what happened to him. No one knows, which I think is great. I do, yeah, uh, yeah. He doesn't. He can he do might, whatever he wants. He might even still be alive. We don't know. We can't prove it. <laughs> Out of anyone who could still be alive, it's him. Yes, I agree. He's in good I, shape. He walked. Yeah. He's the only. <laughs> he's uh. So so listen. If you're listening to this at Comic Con, and you're walking around and it's hot. And you're getting annoyed with the lines and all the chaos. Just remember yeah. this guy. This yeah. guy, he really did it. He went for it and he did it all carrying around a 60-pound book in a yep. baby stroller. Everywhere. In a Everywhere. baby stroller. <laughs> I want, here, speaking of cosplay, someone's got to dress as this dude. I Push think you a just, baby stroller with a book in it. That's actually a good idea. That would be, be a fun one to do. be fun, yeah. I can't. Uh, I, all I want to do is look look de- in detailed into these pages and read every single one of these, but I'm not going to right now. Oh, you know um, what? Funny you should say that. Oh. One last thing. Okay. So, Hannah. What? Do what? Do you, by any chance, have um, $250,000 lying around? No. Are you sure? You want to double check real quick? Let's let's pretend that I do. Yeah, I okay. found some. It's 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 down here. Uh, in in my in my sh- I don't know my shoe. Oh, it's on sale. What? What? So the I believe the Rob oh, Collection, they're selling it. Why? You can purchase this book from the Rob Collection for two hundred and fifty thousand oh, no. dollars. I want this so bad. I know you do. Because my I told be you yours. my family my family are all bookbinders, right? Yeah. This is this is up my alley. Yep. I gotta ask my sister if she's heard about this. I thought you were gonna say I gotta ask my sister for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Uh uh. She's in her twenties in New York. There's no two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So the Rob collection? Okay. Oh look at this. What have you done? (laughs) Oh, what have you done? I can't stop. So shout out to Mikulich, our original autograph collector. (laughs) And the original obsessive. We salute you. Obsessive ADHD guy, because I'm sure yeah. that's part of his diagnosis, 100. right? Yeah, <laughs> he's no one of us. Not. He's, he's seeking the next, like every single he's one of these restless. gave him a shot of dopamine that the farming life couldn't give him. But he's got that farmer's work ethic, which is he what does. I love. He just was like, I don't give a shit. I'm going to keep I'm gonna going. I'm going to carry this. Yeah. I'm going to carry this for how many miles? It's 60, Honestly, 000? that's like, uh, it was like 200,000 or something. Oh, no, no. <laughs> 60,000 was the signatures. And he walked the whole way. No trains? I mean, I I don't know if it, like no trains. I just mean that okay. like he wasn't like traveling by car or anything. Like okay, he. I mean, I know he definitely got on a bunch of boats. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think he just sort of did You'd whatever. Have to. 
Yeah, he, I, I can't prove that he didn't get on any car. I'm sorry. No, it was 175,000 miles. That's so many miles. It's a lot of miles still. Yeah. This anyway, dude. Okay. That's my tab. I have to shut my iPad. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah. That was, you know, I love that you did. I love that you didn't do something exactly Comic Con related, but very adjacent. Like, this is the kind of person that comes to Comic Con. Exactly. Like, he would have loved it. He would have loved it. Oh, he would have loved it. He, he would have loved to cosplay. Everybody. Yeah. He, yep. He would have loved showing off his giant book baby. Uh, People would want to take pictures of it. They'd be like, what is that oh, a yeah. cosplay of? And he'd be like, what's cosplay? <laughs> He's like, I don't know how I got here. What yeah. are those things outside <laughs> that carry you around? Uh, I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody help me. Uh, yeah, no, this guy's this guy's awesome. Something about him is just so like kindred spirit. Endearing. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, yeah. Oh, what a wholesome Joja dude. Mikulich. Yeah, Thank he's a wholesome you. guy. Yep. Uh, anyway, and thanks so, for listening. Yeah, to our, well, we're not. We're not done. Shoot. We're not done. What are you talking about? <laughs> we're just finishing that one thing. I'm sorry, the um, headband gave me memory loss. That's true. Okay, so we are at the time of the show where we're going to close our tabs. Okay. Um, what do you think we should use hmm. for sound effects? Ooh, that's a tough one because... Neither of ours include oh. explosions or death or... How... <laughs> Which is weird. Yeah, usually it's very it's rare. Like, I only mentioned death like once. Yeah. No, no, I mentioned it multiple times. Never mind. I wish death on all those old men. Yeah. Um, uh, what do you we think? We could do. We could just do like a like basic a comment, boat? like punch pow, like <laughs> oh, push, push. yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, or like, like Batman, yeah. like the yeah. like the Adam West Batman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a bunch of yeah. old timey like three punches co- comic <laughs> sounds. <laughs> Get zooks. Or maybe like a like one of those like songs <laughs> that comes. Oh, we should just start adding transitions like that in between each one of our segments. That would be oh really yeah. Fun. Anyway, okay. Make Alyssa, uh, Alyssa's whole job way harder. <laughs> it's already the worst for her. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, Alyssa. Okay. okay. Why don't you go ahead and count us down? All right. Let me open up the tabs. Of course. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Three, two, one. Punch it close. Boom, 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 boom. Cozy. All right. Moving on to cool. listener emails. I believe you are up first. I am first. So this comes from Grace from Philadelphia. Grace. And Grace says... Hello, 500 open tabs. My name is Grace, and I'm writing to you from Philly, go birds, about a tab that I have open, and I refuse to close. You may have seen this on TikTok or Instagram. No. I already know. No. According to Wikipedia, (laughs) Uh uh, and Google translates automatic translation from Dutch to English, this is an underwater camera positioned at a gate in a canal in Utrecht that live streams fish approaching the gate. Okay. User, users log on to the live stream and can ring the doorbell if they see a fish, which alerts an <laughs> operator to open the gate <laughs> and let the fish through. So <laughs> This is the stupidest thing ever. I love it. So dumb. This helps the fish amazing. Tra- traverse through the locks in lieu of the traditional fish ladder, which I don't know what a fish ladder is, but I really want to go look about it. Look it up. How else do you think that fish are supposed to reach the ceiling? They don't swim up there. They got to go on a ladder. I just obviously. don't think about fish very often. Well, that's your first mistake. Did I know? <laughs> uh, here's the article about it, and we'll link it. Um, I've yet to see a fish myself, but I refuse to give up on the fish doorbell. So I keep the tab open on my phone so I don't forget about it. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this live stream of a real live stream as much as I've enjoyed <laughs> As much as I've enjoyed uh, listening to your podcast, keep it Josie, Grace. I love and it. When you go to the fish stream, hold on. You, it's just like underwater. And if you see a fish, you can you can like alert them. What? Oh, um, I see. Do you think we can see a fish right now? Maybe we can see one while we're recording. Oh, let's see. We should have read this at the top of the episode yeah, and we just like had it on in the background the entire time. There's pictures of other fish. Anyway, this is not going to be that interesting for people watching the podcast. Care. But we will include it in the show notes. Yes, we will. You can see if you can spot some fish. So thank you, Grace. For our second email or listener email, I'm very excited because we finally at long last have our first um, audio submission. Yeah. So 
I'm going to go ahead and send you the clip. We're going to okay. play it. Dear Kaveh and Hannah, I have a confession. I'm not really a tab hoarder, so I always struggle to come up with something interesting to send you guys, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Today's new episode got me thinking about the Olympics, since you mentioned Mark T. Smith did art for the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Very cool. And I know you two are just so excited for the Olympics to come to Los Angeles in 2028. Oh, but thrilled. have you heard of World Pride, a series of international LGBT pride events that have been colloquially referred to as the Gay Olympics by mm. Australian media outlets due to its scale and the bidding process for choosing host cities? The first World Pride was held in the year 2000 in Rome, Italy, and the ninth World Pride is going to be in Washington, D.C. next year. Do you know what else is coming to D.C. soon? That's right, the pandas. So, is the conclusion <laughs> that D.C. is perhaps the place to be in 2025? You decide. <laughs> Thanks for being the highlight of my Wednesday mornings with love, Jazz, from the Discord, and also from Texas. <laughs> oh, Thank you, well, Jazz. Well, it looks like we're going to go to the Gay Olympics and see yeah. some pandas, right? Uh, I'm just going to say I was really excited to hear uh, a listener's voice. That was yeah, wonderful. That was cool. Thank it kind of made me feel like this was all real, you know? Yeah, that's why I really wanted to do the the audio <laughs> clips because yeah. I was like, like it'll there's real help people. us. Yeah, it's not just a chat bot that's sending us fake it's emails weirding this entire me out. time. Yeah. That's awesome. No, I did not know about the, the Gay Olympics. What do um, they do in the Gay Olympics? It's just regular Olympics or is it, is it like... <laughs> Never mind. Regular Olympics. I was going to say, or is it just like gay stuff? <laughs> I decided to not they're really, elaborate. They're doing gay stuff. Um, let's see. They're hosting. Da, 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 da. Its core events include opening and closing ceremonies, a pride parade by the host's existing pride parade, or a bespoken event organized specifically for World Pride and LGBT Human Rights Conference. Oh, cool. All right. Yes. Uh, um, excellent. Thank you, Jazz. Thank yeah, you for thanks, the tab. Jazz. And thanks for all your great comments on the Discord and um, also the episodes themselves on Spotify. I always love seeing what, she, what Jazz writes. Yeah, Jazz is a gem. Thank you. <laughs> they're, always, they're always nuts. <laughs> uh, uh, if you also have an email that you would like to submit, or even better, much like Jazz, voice memo. A, uh, a voice memo, go ahead and send it to us at 500opentabs at gmail.com. That's 500 open tabs. Uh -huh. uh, Give us a little blurb about what you learned that was fun. Make sure to include the link. And of course, we like to know where you are from. Yeah. But moving on, uh, normally we would close out the show. Right. But uh, since we're in San Diego right now, we thought we didn't want to say this up front just in case uh, you were somebody who had never heard this show before and were interested right. in it because we talked about it because you had the fan or something. But um, for everybody else, we thought we'd just go really quickly through um, some of the stuff that we're going to have at the convention, uh -huh. <clears throat> meaning my table and Hannah's table, which is right next to each other. So, uh, Hannah, do you have anything you would like to show or talk about? Uh, yeah, I, I, it's exciting because I, this is the first year I'm going to have um, my book, like specifically my book that's coming out in October. I'm going to have uh, tote bags to give away to people who pre-order them. Oh, you do? And, um, nice. Yeah, and uh, you can see the picture of that on the thing. I haven't sent it to you because I can't find it. Um, That's okay. But it'll go up on the screen right now for yeah. all you YouTube people. And like bookmarks and, and special stuff that comes from pre-ordering the book while at Comic-Con. Uh, and then also I will have two new zines, which are just like, mm. I call them zines, but they're just little books. And uh, here, Kyle, I'm going to send you the, um, there's a, there's one about nature and mm -hmm. it's called 100% true. Sorry. What's it called? 100% <laughs> accurate book about nature. Oh, and it's filled with true facts. And then one called Enjoy Your Life. Uh, sorry, Enjoy Yourself because That's turns an awesome out, cover. Thank you. I have drawn so many things eating themselves that it, it yeah. warranted its own zine. So I've seen this. Uh, yeah. It's, these I look think great. It's How long theme. are each one of these? Oh, the nature one's like 48 pages. Oh, wow. It's um, like a full on thing. It's, yeah. It's, uh, and it's nonsense. I wrote a lot of it at like 2 a.m. So nice. But it's, they're both comic collections uh, of a lot of older stuff that I don't usually put into prints because no one buys them, uh, but they are still enjoyable. And they'll be 15 bucks each, and you can do, you can do a few for a deal or something. Also, I'll be drawing cat portraits. That's so. right. You will be. Awesome. I what look forward you? to... Uh, let's see. So I thought... <clears throat> I had this idea where um, I wanted to do... I was not able to get a book done for this convention. Mm. As you have pointed out, I tend to have an insane rate of... Uh, of, yeah, of completing production. books 
Uh, although I did write a book and I sketched one out. You I did? Just, yeah. I didn't know I'm that insane. you would finish sketching it out, you psycho. That's awesome. I am a psycho. I did it. I just Good was job. like, I couldn't finish. I was like, I didn't want to rush it. Although I really Good. did want to have it for this one. Um, it was, it's, I'm really excited about it too. I actually kind of like, I'm sad that I didn't get to finish it, but I think also, you've mentioned it before and I'm also very excited about it. So maybe the next yeah. convention, maybe the next convention I'll have it. We'll see. But also we were getting so much stuff ready for this, for yeah. the podcast and the, and the scavenger hunt and the fans and the actual panel. Like there was just so much to do yeah. that I didn't have enough time to do that, unfortunately. But I promise I'll have another book next year. I literally am sitting on four books right now because I'm wild. an insane person. That's um, awesome. But in the meantime, I thought it would be fun to have at least a few new illustrations that I wanted to do. So I had this idea of we were talking about cosplay and like, you know, even fan art being part of um, the convention circuit and stuff. But I was like, uh, it would be fun to do fan art of my own characters and books, but like <laughs> in the style of of other stuff that I like. Because I was like, I don't want to just do fan art of other people's stuff. I want to do it of yeah. my stuff. So cool. I, I decided to do a couple of these. The first one I did um is for the Mothman, but I wanted to look at these old style uh, drawings of Spider-Man that like J.R.J.R. did, you know, John Romita yeah. Jr. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm calling this the um, Your Friendly Neighborhood Mothman. <laughs> and so cool. <laughs> this is this Dope. really goofy print. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, the colors in the sky, top notch. Also, thank those you. clouds, beautiful with the backdrop thank you, of the thank yellow. You. Um, immediately, that was the first thing I saw. Ah, oh, I always love your color. Very good at Thank it. You. Oh, okay, so there's a Mothman eating a, eating a drumstick from KFC. Is that KFC? <laughs> yeah. So there's this this really famous, insane looking KFC that's in Koreatown. That's off of Western, and it just kind of looks like a weird. It's like an abstract modern giant bucket. Uh, <laughs> it's the yeah. ugliest thing you'll ever see. It's terrible. I love it. <laughs> and Mothman's perching on it, and above is yeah. the classic LA helicopter, obviously yep. circling the city. This is so this I, is dope, I, dude. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying to give a shout out to, you know, because John Rita Jr., who I love, was a huge hero of mine growing up and still yeah. to this day as an adult. Uh, he he does these drawings that are like these quintessentially like New York, like skyline with all these like New York. Yeah. So I was like, there's none of that that's like for L.A., but I wanted to do it stupid because that's how I always do it. So I'm like, it has to be the LA dumbest is. thing of L.A. Exactly. So there's that. Uh, and then I also did another print that's um, a shout out to Bruce Tim, who did. Uh, Batman the Animated Series, and I loved Ooh. the old drawings of Love that um, show. <clears throat> me too. Uh, so this is Byron the Snowman, who's one of the characters in my Perma <laughs> Friends book. <laughs> I saw this when you you hadn't finished it. You had sent me it. Yeah. Um, he's uh, so it's a, go ahead. Yeah. No, what's the guy's name? Mister Freeze. Mister Freeze. I almost called him Doctor Ice. <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Ice. Not not a thing. That's what I'm going to call this print. Doctor Ice. Doctor Ice. So yeah, it's 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 uh your snowman character as Doctor Ice or what is it? Oh. Byron as Doctor uh, Mister Freeze. This is really cool. It's a and mashup. It does remind so, me a lot of the the TV show of the Bruce. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I I thought it was fun because you know a lot of times you do these. You can copy someone's drawings or you can sort of yeah. try to do it in the style of them. And when you think about them in terms of the style of that person's uh, drawing. It uh -huh. really teaches you to like really super pay attention because you're not just copying the same image over the same character and you have to really learn to reinterpret to it. So get the essence of it. I, yeah, I, it was a really fun yeah. exercise. I want to try that. Yeah. And then I have another one that I'm not totally, it's not finished. Um, so I may or may not do it, but uh, I might cut this if I don't like how it turns out. But I wanted to do one that's oh, um, Avocado is... Chronicles. Oh, yeah. Okay. You oh, seem to like it. Oh, this is cool. Um, of course I'm blanking on the, the artist's name. It's Mike Mignola. Mignola, I don't know. Yes, this looks like a Mike Mignola. This is awesome. What are you talking about? Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Oh, this uh, is It's cool. like in the style of Hellboy, I yeah. was doing uh, Avocado Chronicles, which is my other strip. Oh, that contrast is great. Look at that. Thank you. I'm going to color that one too. I think I just want to, you know me, I get obsessive. I have oh, to like yeah. I don't ever, so I wouldn't understand. Um, so... I'm going to have those prints um, in the spirit of um, fan art. I'm, it's not going to be like super fancy and expensive. I'm going to try and make it more affordable. So I'll have those. I'll also have some, I think I'll have some more. I have taken makes that I'm trying to get done by the time this comes oh, out. Oh, cool. The Mothman. So those were the, the Mothman taken makes. Yeah, yeah. So it'll come with, uh, it'll be the LA 
the Hollywood edition that will come with a emotional support dog or a nice latte. Uh, look out for those. You should do one holding a Botox injection needle. Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, maybe next year. Botox and coffee, d- dude. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm somewhat relieved to be here at Comic-Con right now as we record this. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know what to do with my life after this is done. Um, <clears throat> Get ready for New York. Mm, yeah, that's right. All right. In the meantime, uh, you can go ahead and follow us on YouTube, on Instagram, Insta, on yeah. we have a Patreon. Discord, Patreon. Give Patreon. It to the Patreon. I've been putting um, like deleted clips on uh, a couple of us each having our own respective laughing fits that mm-hmm. we had to cut out. Um, we had a good one today. We had a we had a great one today. <laughs> it wasn't great. I barely remember it. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, that's it yeah. Come back next week where we will have no Comic Con related. Uh, we will be we'll... so tired. Yeah, we're going to be very tired after this, yeah. as we always are. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully not sick because there's hopefully. a lot of people that go through those floors. Anyway, yeah. uh, thank you for listening. Thank you in advance if you do come to our table for visiting us. And thank you. as always, tell your friends, tell share. your nemeses, share it with everybody. And if you know uh, a cosplayer meantime, in your life and you'd think they'd yeah, be interested in this, yeah, send this to somebody who cosplays. Yeah, Seriously, send this to a person. Everyone knows se- one. Yeah, send this to a person that you know that walks around with a 60 pound uh, autograph, autograph book on his back. Book. Send it to all your farmer friends that you know. Yeah. Send, send it to your Croatian friends. Croatian farmers. I'm sure we all have one of those, you know? At least one. Send it to Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore, go just put it on his grave. Yeah, put it on his grave. Send it to everybody uh, Uh and uh, share the wealth. Anyway, thank you. And until next week, keep it Josie, everybody. Keep it Josie. 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 Does your Josie say Josie or Josie? Josie, yeah. Mm -mm. It's Josie. They can can battle it out. Bye.